Hey everyone from all over the world, it's me, Jeremy Alexander Newsome, Small Box with Brian Masterson, the Big Box. <laughs> we're about yeah, you're you're the big box in my view, I'm the small box in my view. <laughs> perception, perception is reality. I like it. But I'm rec I'm recording the big box version of Brian. You look really good today, by the way, man. Thank you, I appreciate yeah, it. You look real good. So this is on my phone camera because my uh, computer camera wasn't, or my computer s Skype app wasn't to let me log in. So deal with me. If it falls over, if there's some type of glitch, I promise I'll get back as soon as possible. No worries, man. No worries. Well, I'm pumped. Uh, we're gonna we're diving deep into crypto land tonight. Folks, we have the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Ash Oro, in the building. It's been a long-awaited interview. Uh, we've had a few schedules. He just got back from a crypto cruise, and we had some scheduling conflicts. We finally nailed down a time or date. It's about six, almost seven p.m. Central, and it's almost nine a.m. where you're at, Ash. Where are you in the world right now? Currently in Bali, Indonesia. I like it. So, what brought you over there, man? Because you used to live in Denver with your with your younger brother, good friend of mine, Zane. So, what what took you over to uh, to that area of the world? Yeah, you know, I just had an itch to travel, and I went on this program called RemoteYear.com, mm. and and although it was a, a really interesting program, it wasn't geared towards entrepreneurs like myself, online digital entrepreneurs. So. I traveled with them to a few places, split Croatia, Budapest, Hungary, Lisbon, Portugal, and decided that three months was enough for me to be on this 50-person type, very organized, overly organized type of program. And I split out on my own and moved to Chiang Mai, Thailand, where I lived for about five months. And um, Chiang Mai is awesome. Uh, anybody that has an online business or if you're looking to network with people that have online businesses, it's a huge digital nomad scene there, but it's a real grind, man. I mean, everybody's there just working and building and going to meetups and networking. And I wanted to have a little bit slower lifestyle. So a couple of weeks ago, I moved here to Bali, which also has a lot of digital entrepreneurs, but a little yeah. bit different. So it's just a nice change of scenery. Yeah, right on, man. Beautiful. And how did you get uh, involved in the crypto space? Because I know at one point you were working on another podcast and I don't know if you're still doing that one or are you? Is it uh, Liberty Entrepreneurs? Yep. Yep. So my podcast is still Liberty Entrepreneurs. We, we release um, infrequently now. We used to release every week, but as you build more businesses, you know, it's difficult to yeah. organize and have time for all of them. But um, yeah, so I was in way before cryptocurrencies were invented. I was a big gold and silver guy mm -hmm. because I, I have dedicated my life to learning about and spreading the word about personal freedom mm -hmm. and individual liberty. And a big part of that was for me learning about how closely tied economics is to freedom. And so I, I started reading Austrian economics and just really digging in deeply on how economics provided a gateway to individual freedom. Because if you don't own your money, then you don't own what money represents, which is your time. Yeah. Right. And so gold and silver to me were at the time back in the late 2000s were represented free market money or a money that gave competition to the fiat government money that we tend to use every day. And it was with this understanding of what free market money and just the importance of currency competition was that in 2011 led me to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But even, even then, I was so deeply entrenched in the idea that gold and silver were it. That was going to be the money that yeah. freed the people that I didn't take a real serious, you know, considerable look into cryptocurrencies back then. It was really only Bitcoin until 2013. Yeah. But yeah. the properties are the same and the end result, I think, is the same. So, so Ash, um, <clears throat> Trace Mayer, are you, are, you, are you good friends with him at all? Uh, Trace is a buddy of mine. Okay, nice. Actually, when I first got involved with Bitcoin and blockchain, he was one of the first. It was run. It was still run to gold, and yep. uh, that's how I first really dove deep. Uh, but yeah, a lot it seems like you guys might have some uh, a lot of similar interests. Yeah, I've, I've hung out with Trace quite a few times and had an unbelievable conversation with him. You know, he's he's one of those younger gold guys like I am that we're, we were still young and digital enough to 
understand and respect the properties of gold, mm -hmm. but also able to see those same properties in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies themselves. Wow. Okay. So, so uh, a question before we go down the uh, ever per real rabbit hole, um, what, uh, what was your first um, thought as to why gold and bullion is a better solution than our current economic and fed federal note, which we all know is, <clears throat> is printed by a private corporation and yeah. kind of what, what was, what led you to that? Just the study of Australian economics or something else or. Yeah, I would say that it was twofold. Um, one was gold is scarce by the physical world and it takes a lot of energy and focus to bring new gold into the, mon the, the monetary system. And I saw that whenever I started understanding that at the time, I think gold was about $700 and they were saying something like, you know, it cost about $550 to bring an ounce of gold into existence, oh, wow. like out of the, out of the ground. Yeah. I was like, wow. And then they're selling it for like $700. So this is a business. And then I started looking at the government's money, fiat money, and it costs them about the same to print a, a $1 note as it does a $100 note. And I was like, well, that doesn't seem right. What if it was the same to mine one ounce of gold as it was a hundred ounces of gold? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Hmm. The, other thing, the other thing that helped me understand and respect um, gold and silver was that it wasn't centralized. So the U.S. government has a monopoly on the creation of fiat currency within the United States, but not one private company has a monopoly on digging gold. And if I wanted to grab a shovel or a pan or a pick or whatever, I could go out to the creek and try to mine for gold myself. Oh, I'm probably not going to find anything, yeah. but I could do it. And, I, you know, it, it's not illegal. So the combination of seeing work put in to create the money. And uh, the decentralized nature of bringing the money into existence, money, I mean, gold, you know, really caught my attention. Yeah. And the, and the uh, deflationary aspect, if you will, the finite amount, <clears throat> though, I'm sure you realized, you know, trading gold or going to the grocery store or going to the gas station. Um, yes, it's a form of legal tender, but it's hard to transfer across seas, across even state lines. If I want to send gold back home to the north, I, I mean, you're paying a lot of money in order yep. for that to happen. So when you were studying the bullion um, aspect of uh, economy, uh, did you, you knew that it needed to be a solution. Is that what another reason that attracted you to the cryptocurrency element? Well, even before that, I quit my engineering job of seven years to move to the Caribbean to help a guy named Peter Schiff build Euro Pacific Bank. And we rolled out the first gold backed debit card. So that okay. was our that was our solution because I you know I started as a commission only sales guy at the bank and ended up as their head of business development when I resigned um, mid last year, but our idea was we're going to be a bank that you can denominate your your savings basically in gold and silver. We had um, a partnership with the Perth Mint in Australia, mm -hmm. and then we had uh, a membership with Mastercard, and we were going to facilitate you could sell your gold and fund up your debit card and then spend it anywhere MasterCard was available. Okay. And, and, there, and there's various issues with that. But you know, I used to tell my clients, um, it's hard to travel with gold and silver. Not only is it expensive, so you don't really want to send it with FedEx or the, the, the UPS, but it, it's, it's heavy and it's hard to travel with it on your person. And whenever you go through, you know, anytime you travel internationally and you go through customs, you're like, do you have... Ten, are you carrying ten thousand U.S. dollars or more of whatever right. with you? Which I always and, have to know, say yes to. I always, I mean, it's <laughs> baller status yeah, over right. there. That's right. <laughs> but but the little machines you walk through, they call them metal detectors. But in fact, I think they're precious metals detectors. They don't care if you hijack a plane. Really, they care if you're carrying, you know, a hundred ounces of gold with you. So you walk through these precious metals detectors. <laughs> Or you've got to pay an arm and a leg to try to move this stuff around the world. And our solution at the time was a, you know, a gold and silver back debit card. But then that started, you know, since I knew the solution to the problem that we were currently trying to bring to the marketplace with a debit card, whenever I learned about cryptocurrencies, I was like, ah, we don't even have, we don't have the burden of the physical world now 
you know, that we have to carry this stuff. We, we used to have to use and depend on the physical world to bring the, the limited nature or, or the rare nature of goods to, to, in order for them to be money. Now with blockchain tech, we could have rare digital goods. Yeah. And we, and we no longer, we could shed the counterparty risk of the physical world when it came to our money. Yeah. So the, uh, the two pizza guy, I, I it resurfaced back into the news recently. Um, yep. But there, there need to be a, a group of people or a community to put worth on this digital asset, um, which took a while. Now, mm-hmm. I, this is all personal belief, but now I believe it has the, the market or industry has inflated a little bit. But um, talk to us how you've seen the, the kind of the, the inception of the cryptocurrency industry with Bitcoin being the first. There wasn't high transaction fees. Um, the mining difficulty was different. The Ethereum is quote unquote, the first crowd sale, if you will, will, um, speak to us about the tokenomics back at the beginning and, and what you thought of that and how it's changed to where it's at now. Cause it has significantly changed. Yeah, it's changed a lot. And not only have the incentives for different blockchains changed, but the inflation and how that inflation is used. You know, back in the freedom movement, and when we were big time into, when I was big time into gold and silver, uh, the the concept for inflation, if you inflate anything, any money, then it's evil, right? And, and, And that was because inflation has always been forced or involuntary. The government prints new money, which inflates the money supply, which devalues the purchasing power and worth of the money you have in your pocket. And then gradually, as you would expect, prices rise as your money depreciates. The government very cunningly says that the rise in prices is inflation, when in fact, the rise in prices is just an effect of the decreased purchasing power of your money because of the inflation or the inflating of the money supply that they do. And I was, I, I was very much into that. So whenever Bitcoin came out, a lot of people wanted to say it was a, a deflationary currency, just like a lot of people want to say that gold's a deflationary currency, but it's not. Gold increases, it inflates by about 3% per year, just like Bitcoin is currently inflating at around, I think, between 7 and 9% per year. But it got me thinking, like, back, back in the day, Bitcoin incentivized really one type of person, the miners, because they got paid out 100% of all the new Bitcoins created. Right. All the new inflation, all the new coins minted or mined got paid out to the miners. And we had one inflation rate, right? It, it was the inflation rate of Bitcoin and everyone else is kind of tagging on to that. And now what you see is that inflation, when it's used voluntarily, you can do a lot of interesting things with it and you can incentivize your community to use your token in different ways. And one of the first ways I saw this was with the Dash currency. Now, what Dash did was, in, it's a proof of work system. It's based on Bitcoin. It used to be called Darkcoin, um, one of the first privacy tokens. What they did, whenever they rebranded from uh, Darkcoin to Dash, Instead of paying out 100% of the inflation to, to miners, they broke it down. They paid, I believe, 45% of the inflation to miners because you want to incentivize and reward your miners to secure your network. Yep. But, th- but then they paid out 45% of the new inflation to something called masternodes. And masternodes was a regular wallet that you had, but that you stored or you locked in 1,000 Dash and that gave you additional uh, credentials and voting rights in the system. So instead of Bitcoin, where if you wanted to change something in the code, it got to the point where you basically had to convince the miners to do it because they own the hashing power of your network. Without a change in the hashing power, you're not going to come to consensus. And it was a very brute force, barbarian type, I'm going to beat you over the head with a club way to, to govern your blockchain, to govern your community. A blockchain is only the backbone of a community. And so what Dash did was Dash came out and said, okay, we want to give you voting rights. 
but we don't want everybody to get equal voting rights. We're going to do it. And they didn't say it this way, but this is the model they took back when the United States was just a couple colonies and they were starting to incorporate the United States. Only landowners could vote because mm-hmm. that showed that you had bought into the system. Yeah. You bought into the community. You, you put your, yeah, you put your capital and locked it into land. And over time that would increase the price of land because it reduces the sellers mm-hmm. of land. And so what Dash did was these master nodes, they, they really revolutionized digital property because now you're locking a thousand Dash. Now at the time I was giving presentations on this, Dash was at like $5 and now I think it's at $600, $700. Yeah. Reached its peak, as you guys know, of like 15, 1600. Yeah. But if you were willing to put your capital, lock your capital up in this community token called Dash, then you got voting rights. But because you're showing your dedication to that community, they would pay you out part of the inflation, just like as if you were a miner running a mining rig. And I really like that because it incentivized people to pay more attention to the community, to pay attention to what these votes were, to pay attention to what these changes were. And it also, one really interesting thing about Dash is the remaining 10%, so 45% to the miners, 45% to the master nodes. 10% 10% went into this treasury and people could submit proposals to this treasury. And let's say you guys wanted the Dash community to sponsor this podcast. Well, you would write in to the Dash community. You would submit your application and tell them what you're doing, how long you're doing it and how much Dash you want to get paid. And the master nodes vote up or down, yes or no, if they want to accept and approve your treasury proposal. If you get approved, then you literally get Dash sent to your wallet address. If you don't, then you don't. (laughs) But we're really seeing a change in how we incentivize our communities through the tokenomics of these different blockchains and of how we use inflation to incentivize and de-incentivize certain actions in our communities. It's really amazing. Up to this point, the only people that have been able to do this is the governments. They print new money. They give it to their buddies in the pharmaceutical industry. They give it to their buddies in the military industrial complex, or they, they give it to their banker friends on Wall Street. And they incentivize <laughs> they, these they, guys. They bail out those bankers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They bail them out and they get to use the money first. And now we get to use the money first because we're inventing it. So you're, so you're talking about the proof of work system and the proof of stake. Or which one are you a more of an advocate for? Proof of work, proof of stake? Or is there something new like uh, a proof of authority or delegated type of uh, um, right. incentive there? Or I, you know, steam it is, is more of a, uh, you, your reputation. And if you're, if you're providing good content out into that community, mind you, I believe steam is probably one of the best uh, blockchain uh, solutions have been pr- provided to the entire ecosystem. Um, but what, where do you, what's your, where are you most advocate for, for as far as uh, proof of whatever, what's your favorite token economy, if you will? Right. Yeah. Good question. And, and this ultimately comes down to consensus because what's the purpose of a blockchain? Well, the purpose of the blockchain is to store truth. And how do we store truth? Well, we need to come to consensus on what truth is and how we're going to store it. And I will always hold dear in my heart proof of work because it's, it's the least elegant. It's the most expensive. And right now it's the most secure, but it was, it was like the brute force method to try to into that introduced us to this whole blockchain and decentralized distributed consensus mechanism. That said, I, I was an engineer for too long to believe that the first iteration of a new technology is going to be <laughs> the final yeah. and the best. Yeah. Look, at, look at plasma TVs back in the day. They were you know, <laughs> this thick. But, but this thick was way better than the old projection TVs that, that were you know, th- this thick. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I, I started to read about proof of stake in 2013, and it really didn't strike me as that significant. And it wasn't until I started studying Steam and um, BitShares and now my favorite blockchain project, which is going to be released on June the 1st, EOS. And all those were created by Dan Larimer, by the way. 
So I'm a fan of proof of stake because it allows for incentive structures other than mining. And I like delegated proof of stake because it removes some of the things that hold back the, and that introduce weaknesses to the proof of stake system. As if you bought a majority of the coins and proof of stake, then you have the highest likelihood each round to be the, the block producer. And that, you know, I won't get into the technicals here, but I, I think that delegated proof of stake is the most superior form of blockchain governance at the moment mm, right. and delegated proof of stake. Uh, the delegated proof of stake blockchains, there's, uh, only a couple right now, and, and I'll just mention the main ones, um, Steam and BitShares, they account for combined, those two blockchains alone combined account for over 50% of all blockchain transactions in existence currently. Wow. And if you want to take a look at some of those stats, you can go to uh, Blocktivity dot info and that'll give you some stats like the number of transactions in the past 24 hours the max transactions that that blockchain has seen in a 24-hour time period as well as the stress level on the blockchain on the number of transactions that it's currently processing you know typically you go there uh, and again that's blocktivity dot info and you can see that uh, the ethereum and bitcoin blockchains both proof of work blockchains which are quite inefficient are typically pegged out and that's why we see the uh, rising prices for each of those chains for transaction fees. Yeah. So Jeremy, I know I'm taking all your questions, man. I'm sorry. (laughs) I I could could talk to you all day. As a matter of fact, I might be booking a ticket to Sydney and and flying down there for my second trip to Australia. But uh, last question, Jeremy, before you can jump in, man, Uh, because I think this is very, very important. I also agree that EOS and what Dan has done there, uh, is extremely revolutionary in, in, but can you, we, one thing that we haven't talked about on our podcast is EOS and the technology behind it. Can you kind of uh, shed some light as to what EOS will be doing, uh, June 1st? Yep. So EOS has been in a year long crowd sale, which got a lot of hate from a lot of people. But if you don't have haters, you ain't doing something right. (laughs) Right. And Dan's doing a lot of things right. And I think that Dan is going to be seen as a combination of the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs of the blockchain operating system world. And I don't say that lightly either. I think I've read probably everything Dan's ever written, seen every presentation and watched every interview that Dan's ever done because I get sucked down these rabbit holes, just like I did with personal freedom and gold and silver back in the day, or hacking Xboxes and Playstations and modding all that stuff. And, you know, I just get down these rabbit holes and I'm so curious that I can't learn enough. And this happened to me with delegated proof of stake. I think the, the main thing, and I'll just go over two things about EOS that has me excited. And nothing of what I'm saying is a buy recommendation. This isn't investment advice. You know, I'm no longer in the banking or investment scene. Uh, do your own due diligence before you invest. That's right. But, but the two things that I think EOS is doing that is different than most other blockchain teams and communities is they're taking a serious consideration to user experience. And you see this with BitShares as well, as well as Steam. Instead of having a 26 or 32 or 36, I can't even remember how many the average number of address letters or numbers in an address is these days. They give you a username like we're all used to. Yep. Ash Oro. If you go on steamit.com forward slash at Ash, A-S-H-E hyphen Oro, O-R-O, you can see me. You can see all my- Make sure you guys go in there and read his articles and upvote them. (laughs) That's right. All of it. Give him some steam. That's right. (laughs) Plug yourself, baby. (laughs) But you you can see that it gives us identity on a blockchain. And I think we're, we're moving towards a society where anonymity on blockchains is starting to become less and less desirable because- whenever you attach yourself to an online persona, you act differently. And in my opinion, you act more respectful than if you had an anonymous identity. 
And this is something that, in my opinion, builds a strong community. You see Steam has a very strong community. And then you see Bitcoin, where you're just represented by these numbers and letters in a public address, and people are fighting, and people don't have consensus, and people are forking off, and people are pissed off at Roger, or they're pissed off at Trace, or they're pissed off at all these guys. And you, you just really don't see that whenever you have a blockchain that concentrates on user experience and the ability to identify yourself. The other thing about EOS that I really like is Dan Larimer has revolutionized the concept of voluntary inflation. And instead, and we just spoke about this, so I won't drag on, but instead of rewarding just the miners or even rewarding the miners and the voters, Dan and his team at, at Block One and EOS.io have figured out a very interesting way to reward the entrepreneurs and the people who are building on these blockchains rather than paying miners up top and hoping that hoping that tr that trickles down to the people actually building on it, the people creating the additional value. Because miners create value in a proof of work system. They mine the blocks, they secure the network, right? They seal the transactions and add them to the blockchain. In, in proof of work or delegated proof of work systems, we also have witnesses that have similar roles. In proof of work, we have people building, let's say, wallets. You need wallets to store your coins, but they don't get paid directly from the blockchain. They, get, they have to get paid um, in an external nature. They have to please their customers and get paid externally. In EOS, let's say you build a wallet and people really like it. Well, to get access to your wallet, maybe you don't just give it away for free. Maybe you stake some of your EOS tokens with that wallet provider. You're not giving up any of your EOS tokens. You're simply staking that token with that wallet provider. And then what happens, and this is very revolutionary, and I can't wait for this to be live so we, us crypto economists can study it for decades from now. <laughs> right. But if, if I'm that wallet provider on EOS, you want access to my top tier wallet. You stake your tokens with me. You, you stay in control of those tokens. You're not giving them to me. You never lose them. But what happens is the blockchain looks for who has these tokens staked with them and the new inflation, the new coins that are mined every day or every 15 minutes or however long new tokens are created in EOS. The people that have the tokens staked with them get the inflation payout. And so if I run a really, really good business, let's say I have the number one wallet in the EOS ecosystem, people are staking their tokens with me. Well, I'm getting paid out some revenue out of the new inflation that comes um, every day from the new coins that are mined. We see this in Steam, right? Basically, what you're doing is whenever you upvote someone, you're putting part of your voting stake with that person. And then whenever the new tokens are created, the blockchain looks and see who has the mo you know, what, what allocation of staked votes do you have on Steam? And we're going to pay you out based on the amount of, of weight, voting weight that people have staked with you. It's going to be similar in EOS, <laughs> and I think it's going to revolutionize wow. uh, blockchain entrepreneurship. Yeah. Which, is, which, which is exactly where I have a lot of my questions too. And again, man, thank you so much for your intel and your information because you always know it's a good guess when me and Brian have like 400 million questions <laughs> <laughs> that we want to ask. Uh, one of the ones I do want to bring up is you as a digital slash virtual entrepreneur, um, yep. I remember as one of my friends on Facebook and just one of my uh, people in my network, you were one of the first people to mention about Bitcoin's high transaction rates. And uh, you were mentioning that probably a, year, a, a while ago, you were like, this is getting a little out of hand when I transfer back and forth. So what, um, what are you personally planning on using as, uh, as a business owner and as, a, as an entrepreneur in your uh, global transactional currency? Yeah. So just recently, my business, Liberty Virtual Assistance, we stopped taking Bitcoin as payment for new clients. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple, a couple reasons for that. One is there's we're a subscription model business. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin hasn't been developed out 
enough to offer a subscription model pull request and I don't have time to go around chasing Bitcoin clients of mine to pay their invoices. Mm -hmm. Another thing was this summer we saw ridiculous prices. Yeah. You know, I've paid over a hundred dollars for a Bitcoin transaction wow. one time, which yeah. is absurd. Yeah. I used to pay, I, it used to pay a penny back sure. in 2013, exactly. 14. Yeah. And then I paid a hundred dollars, but, and we saw latency, we saw mm -hmm. transaction times that were unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what any Bitcoin maximalist or Bitcoin OG thinks about how long or how expensive. I'm a capitalist. I'm an entrepreneur. I know that that was a pain for me in my business. And I know the marketplace is going to come out and create other payment rails that are faster, cheaper, and more dependable. And that's exactly what they're doing. For me personally, um, I have used Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I have used Dash. My favorite tokens to use are uh, BitShares and Steam mm -hmm. because uh, with Steam, as well as with EOS, it, it has zero fee transactions. So you never pay anything to send. And there's three second block times. Uh, similar with BitShares, although they don't have free transactions, but it's like 0 0.0001 cents mm -hmm. to send. Very and again, cool. they have you know less than 10 second transaction times. So. Yeah. We're going to see commerce go towards uh, the coins that are dependable, fast, and cheap. And as much as um, the freedom-loving people of the crypto space, the libertarians and anarchists, don't want to accept it, Ripple is also a really good, fast, cheap, yes, centralized. No, it's not a blockchain. Yes, it's a decentralized ledger. But as someone who built an offshore bank, Ripple is solving a huge pain in the international banking system, which is basically they're using the SWIFT system, mm -hmm. which you might as well think of that as um, it's, it's slow. It takes about three to five days to settle. And you know, you're going to spend easily 35, 100, $150 to send your coins. So Ripple is a very interesting project. I don't own Ripple. I'm not recommending buy Ripple, but it's trying to replace a legacy system by working within the rules and regulations of that legacy system. Sure. And unfortunately, we, we're still cursed with governments and we will be for quite some time. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes sense. Uh, and in regards to, uh, and to that, just quick side note, was it you who mentioned or posted, I think it was today or yesterday, that you're going to change from Steam and go to another site? Busy .org. Yes. Can you tell yeah, us about that? So this, yeah, so this is really interesting. Not a lot of people understand this. Uh, so this is a little, little treat for your audience. But if you think of Steam, Steam is the blockchain, yep. just like Bitcoin is the blockchain, just like Ethereum is the blockchain, where you can go and trace your transactions at like, let's see, ethscan.com or maybe it's dot org or something, but, or you can go to uh, blockchain.info and, and use these block explorers and type in your address and say like, okay, I see everyone that I sent transactions from and everyone that sent transactions to me and when I sent them and how much I sent, these are block explorers. Steemit.com and busy.org are simply visualization block explorers for the Steam blockchain. So you go to these websites and yeah, it looks like a blog post. It looks like a blogging website, but they display the same content, which is stored and, and, and submitted to the Steam blockchain. So if you go to busy.org forward slash at ash, A-S-H-E hyphen oro, O-R-O, it's going to give you the exact same information as if you went to steamit.com slash at ash oro. Right? It's the exact same stuff. Just like if you would go to Bitcoin Block Explorer A, mm -hmm. put in your address, it would give you all the information associated with your address, your account. Mm -hmm. Or if you went to Bitcoin Block Explorer B, it would give you the same information because it's pulling it from the same chain. Gotcha. Well, busy.org and steamit.com do the same thing. It's just a social media block explorer. Totally. So, so um, Ash, I would love your opinion as to kind of what I think will be happening here. I think like a busy.com and building on top of these change is the new entrepreneurial landscape where people will be building new solutions and EOS is providing that 
ever large playing field for everyone to do so. But building wallets, building interfaces, building new blockchains, forking chains, all of that is just child's play, com uh, you know, compared to what's coming and what will, I think, really move this industry in the direction it so desperately deserves to go. Yeah, for sure. And where we're going is an operating system. And think about it like Windows or, or Mac OS X or, or Linux. Imagine if they had access to communicate with an operating system that everyone else running that operating system had the option to communicate as well. And this, I believe this is the OS part of EOS or EOS, right? Now, I don't know what the E stands for and they won't tell anybody. Maybe it's E like E meet, you know, or E date yeah. or something like that back in the day, or maybe it's exponential operating system or, you know, yeah, whatever. But we're moving to a way for us to communicate with each other with blockchains, but build on top of it in an environment like an operating system that we're familiar with. And that's the really special thing about EOS is they are after Dan Larimer built, um, built bit shares and then he built steam and steam it. He started understanding that there's a common set of tools that somebody needs access to in order to build a blockchain app or to build a blockchain period. Mm -hmm. Think about it, you know, to my speaking to my developer friends, think about it like if you try to develop on Windows, well you got to go download your compilers and you got to go download your testing environment, you got to download your IDE and you got to download uh, you know your debugger and all this stuff or you develop in the Linux environment and a lot of that stuff comes preloaded. Ethereum is basically like Windows where, yeah, you're going to get some stuff. EOS is more like Linux, whereas they're going to handle more of your user account creation permissions. They're going to, hand, they're going to give you a, a bigger, better, more developed suite of tools so that you can more quickly build on. And they have the transaction, transactional bandwidth and zero fee transactions that are necessary for entrepreneurs to build on top of. Yeah, that's massive. Do, do you think that BitShares and Stan over there, obviously Dan's father, <clears throat> may combine the two so BitShares may be running as that decentralized exchange for EOS? Uh, you know, and I've asked Stan this and <laughs> he won't answer me. Huh. Um, I, I find Stan to be a very difficult guy to uh, get answers from and to get in touch with. <laughs> Although he's reached out to me to try. Uh, anyways, um, <laughs> I could see BitShares being the financial layer of EOS. That said, there are issues with BitShares. There are issues with their um, little committee or council. There are issues with old wells that are hesitant to change anything. Um, there are issues with the the transaction fee structure is not free to send a transaction in BitShares. They haven't moved over to that, which could cause issues in EOS. So I think that there's a probability that BitShares could be ported over to the EOS environment. But I also see a bigger possibility now. That, so that's what I thought was going to happen. I thought they would just... <clears throat> Recomp recompile and rebuild bit shares to be compatible and be the financial layer in EOS. I think now that what they're going to do is probably rebuild bit shares and shred and like, excuse me, shed some of the, the old baggage that comes along with the bit shares community mm -hmm. and come with a more fair distribution model within EOS and just rebuild kind of from the bottom up and having the lessons that they learned from the original BitShares implementation over in EOS. But that said, there's going to be the best financial layer in the entire cryptocurrency scene built inside EOS. And wow. see, seeing the conflict between Dan and Ned Scott, which was his co-founder and Steemit, there's no doubt in my mind that Dan is also either going to directly build or commission a team to build For a sure. new so social media layer within EOS um, to 
take care of some of the problems, some of the early really weird semi-insta mining where we've got wells and steam that aren't necessarily aligned with the original vision and, you know, just shed away some of the, some of that baggage and have a better distribution model. Yeah. So, so Ash, you're, you're in, you're in the know, you're an, a top expert, a, a thought leader in the space. How many people do you think who are involved in crypto, Jeremy, and, and I'm not going to take away from Jeremy's knowledge in, in, on, on crypto, but he definitely is uh, more on the trading aspect and can, and can make a lot of money going up and down. But from, from the tokenomics ec- aspect, how many people really see that? I mean, cause I agree everything that you're saying and I appreciate uh, I'm a little ad hoc when I talk, so your articulation is much appreciated. But how many people do you think are, are seeing this transformation happen? Because I'm in complete agreement with you. Um, less than one percent of cryptocurrency people in general right now, <laughs> which is probably point zero one percent, zero zero point percent of the populace. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, nobody. Yeah. And yeah. this is what's most exciting. Um, the revolution is alive and people are just still learning about Bitcoin. And a lot of people are just starting to learn about Bitcoin and blockchain. You know, for the most part, nobody understands the depth and the possibilities. And for me, most exciting, the opportunities for personal freedom that come along with some of these blockchains and some of these, this operating system of communication that that people like Dan are building, you know, and Dan's uh, an anarcho capitalist. You know, he's a peaceful, voluntary anarchist, which I just got back from uh, the Anarchapulco conference in Mexico, the world's largest anarchy conference. <laughs> and I this is my third year in a row going and I, I plan to go every single year. And it means a lot to me to promote and support however I can people who are building the next generation of software and, and the ability for communities to come together whenever they have the philosophy of non-aggression and peace. And so for me, I mean, there's, there's no second choice. EOS is by far my favorite blockchain. It, it's going to have a community that's going to blow people away and the opportunities that rest at our fingertips because of guys like Dan and, you know, and he's just a guy, he's just a guy like we are, but mm-hmm. he, he's been able to, to understand the fundamentals of money, fundamentals of what limited government tried to do and know why it can't work and, and know like what it's going to take for us to build the free society that we want so that we can, you know, have the communities that we can trust. And it, it's really exciting. Nobody understands this yet. And just like most people don't understand how a car works or how a computer works, most people don't have to or aren't going to need to understand it because yeah. they're, go- they're going to be able to use it and live it. So, yeah. So, I was going to say, uh, would you agree that this, this is going to bloom into something where it will be running in the background quietly, you can still check it out, but you're going to need technicians to go in there and work on it. But from an end user standpoint, it just needs to work for you. It needs to have a clean UI UX and just yep. you're, you're off to the races. Yeah. Look at steam, look at steam it. Yeah. Right. Look at busy.org. You log in there. You don't know you're using a blockchain. You're yeah. going, it's like, it's like you're blogging on medium.com or you're going to Facebook or Twitter and posting a, a, a post. You, know, you have no clue that it's a blockchain, but it, it works and you get paid out in these blockchain tokens and you can actually cash them out in the real world. And I mean, it, we're getting to the point and I used to, I used to use this phrase back in like 2014, uh, blockchain in the background. We don't need to know how black, most people don't need to know how blockchains work. The only reason I know how to blockchain work is because I was early on in this space and I'm a freaking nerd, right? I'm, I've got two, <laughs> I've got two engineering degrees. I was a programmer. So just like, I understand this stuff, but to anyone listening, if what I said has been overwhelming and I'm sure a lot of it has been, you don't need to worry about this stuff. Not all of the technicalities just start reading, start watching presentations, you know, go on steam and start posting your questions 
And you're going to find your community. You're going to find answers. You're going to find people who are ideology, ideologically aligned with what you believe in. And that's the best thing about blockchain is that it's, for the most part, censorship resistant. And if you want to get your word out there, Mark Zuckerberg's not going to come and, you know, hide your post from people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we like, and I think you already started down it, but uh, we like to kind of end and wrap up our our pod and I'm happy to stay on longer. I have all night. Um, but, uh, you, you, you said, you said people and what they can do. I'm, some of our listeners probably don't even know what steam is, but steam's really cool. There's other topics in there other than cryptocurrency, but, um, I would also encourage our listeners. If you're listening tonight, uh, go out there, get a steam account. If you already have one, start interacting with it, start learning about it. But more importantly, go listen to Dan Larimer's, uh, talks on on eos i'm in full agreement with you ash um i've had conversations with other developers that you know are like hey we need to start moving this way even to the point of hearing the words eos will engulf the entire blockchain industry um yeah. so i mean I, I'm, I'm just looking down um some of the the steam it topics right now and it's everything from life photography there's a huge korean community on there travel blog, art, Spanish, introduce yeah. yourself, na- nature, stories, food, you know, writing, <laughs> it's everything, photos, money, memes. I mean, you can literally create your own meme and go to a uh, dmania.lol post, which is another front end is another block explorer yep. for the steam blockchain, just like steam it. And just like uh, busy.org and post your memes. If you've got a really witty sense of humor, <laughs> post your memes on there and you may make some money. Sure. Uh, yeah. it, it, can I rattle off a couple of the yeah. apps built on steam? Yeah, so absolutely. more entrepreneurs have built more apps on the steam it blockchain on the steam blockchain than probably all other blockchains combined. And here, here's a few of my favorites that I use regularly. Uh, one's called D tube, uh, D T U B E. You can find it at D tube, uh, dot video, or I think they shortened it to D dot tube. Basically it's a decentralized YouTube. So there's, no central authority, you know, Google owns YouTube. Maybe they'll censor your content. Maybe they <laughs> want, maybe they'll display it. Maybe they want, but uh, D.Tube is a decentralized version of YouTube, which, wow. which I upload uh, my podcast videos on. And what do Another you think? What do you, what do you think is going to, what do you think? I mean, simple things like that and decentralizing those type of solutions. I mean, think of the, all the industries that disrupts too. I mean, advertisement. I mean, how is that going to work? You're going to go straight to the end user who's posted the content provider saying, hey, we will pay you this much instead of going through the different corporate channels that are so decentralized. I mean, it's so cool. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's it's so cool. And think about it this way is whenever you post a a video on DTube, well, it's like posting on YouTube. It's got a very similar look and feel to it. But just like when you post uh, like a post, on steam it you post a video on dtube and people can thumb it up i'm looking here i'm just looking at some of my buddies uploading their videos one guy made eleven dollars 130 dollars one guy interviewed one of the main guys on steam uh, and he made 416 dollars right and then you'll see videos on trading you'll see videos on here's one on the mona lisa here's one on a reality check about using some gas in Syria or, you know, there's a report from Anarchapulco, you know, made $500 and it's really insane. And I recommend your users, if you're a content creator, it's to the point where you can't ignore this any longer. Yeah. And so if, if you've got video, check out D.Tube. Um, if, you, if you're just sound-based, there's D.Sound. Uh, oh. No, excuse me. It's dsound.audio. It's basically a decentralized sound cloud. Wow. And you'll log in there and you can upload your cover art. You can upload your, uh, your MP3. And it's a decentralized sound cloud. Again, just like decentralized YouTube. There's one called Zapple, Z-A-P-P-L.com. This is a decentralized Twitter. So they restrict, I think they're still at 144 characters, but anything that you can do on social media or anything that has to do with content 
you're going to be able to do in a decentralized way with the Steam blockchain. And, that, and that's why I do hold Steam. I've, I've been on the Steam uh, blockchain and Steamit.com mm-hmm. since, I think, June 2016. I think they started in May 2016. I interviewed the CEO, Ned Scott, a couple months later. But this is, in my opinion, the, the future of social media. Because think about it this way, and this is for your listeners. If you had, well, let's say Twitter is, or no, let's say Instagram, let's say Instagram. Instagram is your preferred platform, right? It's your platform of choice. There was an, and you had two Instagrams that were exactly the same. And the only difference was that whenever someone upvoted you on, on this one, there was a cryptocurrency payout associated to it. Every, right. every, everything else was the same. Yeah. Would you be more inclined to use the Instagram as it is or the exact same Instagram that had a chance for you to make money on the images that you posted? I mean, it's, just, I, I, it's a matter of time, man. I'm with, I'm yeah. totally with you. Well, that, totally was a, that was a question that I had too, Ash, was just simply, you, you were using the term dollars, but I'm assuming you can get paid out in Steam or uh, another cryptocurrency. Is that correct? Yes. So you only get paid out in uh, the currencies native to the Steam blockchain right now, which are Steam dollars and Steam or Steam gotcha. power. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and I won't, I've been giving so many presentations on Steam lately. I, I won't give a presentation here, but I do want to just in 30 seconds talk about sure. what's, you know, in Dash, we were talking about you kind of lock up your tokens in these yeah. master nodes that shows that you're buying into the community. And it, you get payouts and you get voting rights. In Steam, it's similar but a little different. Um, you lock up, you power up your tokens. So you make, you, you buy Steam or you make Steam, and you power up your tokens. Basically, you lock it in, but you lock it in for a time frame, and it's thirteen weeks. And what happens then is once you lock in your tokens, you're basically telling the community and telling the blockchain, like, I'm committed. I'm buying right. in. I'm, par- I'm part of this. I'm not just going to here kind of make some money and leave, right? I'm committed. What happens is the more steam you power up and turn mm-hmm. it into steam power, well, the, the higher the value of your upvote is worth. Right. And so like if you're brand new on the Steam blockchain and you just first make your first Steam account, your vote may be worth nothing or it may be worth a penny, but nobody really knows who you are and you're new to the community and you know, welcome and let's see what you can offer and provide to us. Let's see what type of content that you can create and how are you going to add value to our community? Myself, I've been, I've been there for what, about, I don't know, 20 months or so now creating content. I create content every single day on Steam right now. Right. And I, I've, got, I've accumulated uh, quite a bit of Steam and I've powered it up into Steam Power. Now my upvote is worth about $8, mm-hmm. right? And so if you get 100% upvote from me, well, that's going to give you $8 allocation of the new Steam tokens that are created in from the blockchain and after people have seven days that they can vote for you and after seven days you get paid out what's really neat is that if people start commenting on my uh on my posts i can upvote their comments Mm -hmm. and so you you don't only have to create content to get an upvote which can pay you out you can also just be a curator a content curator and start commenting on this stuff and it's, and I, I'm, I, I hope probably I will be speaking at podcast movement conference this year in July in Philadelphia on the idea of not only earning cryptocurrency as a content creator, but how to grow your audience with cryptocurrencies. Because now, just like people can upvote my post in my podcast on Steemit. I can upvote people's comment and maybe give them 25 cents. Or if somebody really takes time and gives a really great analysis and overview of, of one of my podcasts, you know, I may give him or her a full upvote of $8 because I can see that it took them time. Imagine what happens uh, again to the audience. If two hypothetical scenarios, your favorite podcaster or your favorite blogger is posting on two different mediums. One you just post your comment and you're like, Hey, you know, thanks for the great content. 
And they're like, hey, thank you for the great content. And over here, you're like, hey, thanks for the great content. And they're like, hey, thank you for paying attention and tuning in. Here's 25 cents. All right. Or here's an upvote that's worth a dollar. Which one are you going to be more incentivized to do? Not only that, think about the comments and the positive and the negative comments. And I'm I'm I'm, it eliminates and it keeps you honest and it keeps you it, it. it really puts your reputation on the line. If you're, if you're being an asshole, people aren't, people aren't going to upvote that, you know? And, right. and, and sometimes you see those posts in social media where you can, all, all you can do is react to that. You can't even delete it unless it's on your or, or report it. So it, I think um, it just keeps people more honest too. And, and what's really interesting is just like I can upvote you and uh, like offer, cryptocurrencies, I can downvote you and take away your cryptocurrencies. Right. And that means don't come on my post, you know, acting a fool (laughs) and harassing me or harassing my listeners or just trolling us. Or I'm going to, you know, if anybody had (laughs) upvoted your comment, I'm going to downvote you, take away your rewards and decrease your reputation on the system. So it incentivizes good actors. Although there is a problem with bots on the platform now, uh, but I th- I think over time that will people will figure out how to sure. do that. Sure. Being nice, what a concept, huh? I know. What a concept. Hey, get I, it, get it. Yeah. No, what's I was up, just, just going to say thank you, man, so much for your time. I, I, we've held you an hour. It's been an absolute honor and a privilege, my friend. Thank you, truly. Ash, Ash, yeah, I, you're uh, welcome. I, I, one, I think. Uh, um, you have provided insight for our listeners that really ha- I've been trying to say what you've been saying for the past <laughs> 20 some episodes. But again, you piece it together very nicely. And I thank you very much for that. Enjoy Australia. Um, after June 1st, uh, I would love to get you back on to talk sure. about uh, EOS and kind of where that's at and how that's going. Uh, and between now and then, let's, let's stay in touch for sure. But thank you very much for your time, man. Yeah, you guys, you're so welcome. You know, I support what you guys are doing. Education is definitely the linchpin of understanding cryptocurrencies and you guys are doing it. I want to give a shout out to my brother, Zane. That's right. Uh, Awesome guy. I miss you a ton, man. And I'll see you soon. Ash, how can people Uh, get in touch with you and check you out? You already gave him your steam. Is there anything? Websites coming, right? Yep. So uh, you can check out ashoro.com. We're currently building it. Just a splash page up there right now. Uh, LibertyEntrepreneurs.com is my podcast. I've interviewed a lot of bosses in the crypto space. Uh, You can check me on Twitter. I think it's at Ash underscore Oro. And um, yes, Steamit.com forward slash at Ash, A-S-H-E hyphen Oro, O-R-O. And if anyone's curious, Oro, no, it's not my real last name, but Oro is gold in Spanish. So it's a little Uh relic of my olden days of loving gold. (laughs) That's right. Uh, That's right. It. Brother, I love it, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You rock. All right, guys. Keep trading those waves. You got it, man. Thank you. <laughs> See ya. See y'all later.